So really important that we get people motivated to move. And I think the key piece is just to move, not so much what kind of movement you're doing or how intense it is, Mm -hmm. but just to get out there and get on a a kind of regular exercise program. And again, the most effective treatments have also been found to be the the least costly and the most accessible, which is really good news for people with ADHD. ADHD Rewired, episode number 58. This is the show designed to help those of us who have really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. My name is Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, coach, and consultant. We know that starting can be the hardest part, so let's get started. But first, let me thank our sponsors. Zoom video conferencing is so easy to use that with all the extra time I saved not having to configure complicated settings, I recorded this promotion. Support ADHD Rewired and check out Zoom video conferencing. Go to erictivers.com slash Zoom. Again, that's erictivers.com slash Zoom. Get a Zoom room. Support for this podcast comes from Audible. For a free audiobook download, go to erictivers.com slash audible for a link for that free download and for some hand-picked recommendations. Go to erictivers.com slash audible for your free audiobook download. Before we get to today's interview, I'm going to tell you about something and I'm going to do it in under 60 seconds. I'm setting a timer now. I'm going to be coming out with an ebook, an ADHD rewired ebook, and I want to know what you want in it. But I'm going to throw in a little incentive there. It's a really, really quick survey. There's like one or two questions. It will take you probably one minute. It's going to be available in the show notes, in the app, on the webpage, and in the ADHD rewired Facebook community. I'm going to send you a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's going to be something that should be in the ADHD the toolbox, the survival kit. But for you to enter this contest to to win, you need to complete this survey. Thank you. All right, under 40 seconds, let's do it. Now onto the interview with Stephanie Sarkis. Welcome back, Stephanie Sarkis, to another episode of ADHD Rewired. You guys heard Stephanie last week. We were talking about how to get rich quick. No, we weren't actually talking about that. We were we were, we were talking about financial management uh, with ADHD. And uh, Stephanie has a new book that is coming out in July, between somewhere between July and May or July. Yeah. Yeah, between May and July. Yeah. And I know but people uh, can pre-order on Amazon now. Okay, so we haven't even told them what the book is about. Well, we kind of mentioned it last week, but you know that was last week. That was last week. So uh, Stephanie is a, um, you know, Stephanie, give us the the twenty second. Who are you? Uh, I am Dr. Stephanie Sarkis. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I have a blog in Huffington Post, Psychology Today, and I've also uh, written now five books on ADHD. Wow, that's 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 commendable. Thank you. I, I am thinking now in the process of writing my first ebook with some help from, from someone. Um, oh, good. Yes. Oh, and, and I just taught everybody last podcast how to peel a banana the correct way. So that's another thing that's important. That's awesome. That yep. I want to check out last week. Valuable tips, mm-hmm. especially on banana it'll peeling. Change, it'll change your life. Yeah. <laughs> so not only do I write books, I, I know how to, to uh, cut fruit. And you know, peel it. So don't split yet. Ah. Ah, ah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so your new book. Let, let's just dive right into it because I know that you uh, time is limited uh, right now. Um, you're writing a book on natural relief for for ADHD. Is that? It's, say, yeah, say it's the a title. book on non medication treatments for ADHD mm-hmm. that you can use with or without medication. Okay, and we talked before. Um, you know, a few weeks ago about, uh, I think we were actually on the same page about this, that whole term of natural treatment. It's a, you know, it's a kind of a marketing term and that whole idea that the cyanide is natural and, you know, all this thing that can kill you a natural. And, and um, you um, told your editor of your, your, the publisher of your book that you really wanted to make sure that the subtitle included what? 
that it was uh, to be included that that people could take medication as well. Um, so the the publisher has a series, uh, Natural Relief Four, and it's you know has different you know ADHD or depression, anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just want to make sure there's emphasized that medication is also um, a, a well documented, researched, effective treatment. Okay. So what are some of the the, the kind of pieces of this book that you're you're wanting to share with people? Well, I think one of the most important uh, non-medication treatments for ADHD is exercise. That's been showing a lot of effectiveness. Even exercising for five to f- or fifteen to thirty minutes can boost the levels of neurotransmitters in your brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, neurotransmitters or brain chemicals are low in ADHD. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, omegas, uh, omega three, six, nine, have been showing uh, help somewhat helping with ADHD. Mm-hmm. Also, mindfulness meditation has been showing effectiveness in studies as well. So. Uh, the another neat thing about non-medication treatments that have been shown to be effective in research is that they tend to also be lower cost and really accessible too. So mm-hmm. that's good news to everybody with ADHD. Now, do you look at this from a, a, a point of alternative treatments or as complementary treatments? Uh, I, I look at it as, like I said, like the book title says, you know, stuff you can use with or without ADHD. Mm-hmm. Um, some people choose not to take medicine. They can't take medicine. Um, and so this is for people that, you know, either that's the life situation or if people are taking medicine, you can add this to mm-hmm. it. So, Stephanie, why, oh, do you, why do you think so many people are really afraid of, of medication and yeah. really prefer, like, just, you know, we'll say, I just want to do things the natural way. Where, where do you? I don't know if I call it afraid. I think people are concerned um, because sometimes there's misinformation of, uh, online. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, people aren't aware of studies that show if you take medication, you actually have a lower risk of substance abuse mm-hmm. than if you if you don't take medication. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, sometimes people just for whatever reason, side effects, or if they have an addiction history, can't take medication as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause I I mean, I do think certainly there are people who can't take medication because from what you just said, the the side effects, but you know, I I do, I do come across many people who, you know, before even really knowing and understanding medication, you know, just say that they just want to do the natural, you know, approaches and, I actually have an entire chapter in the book on medication talking about, you know, what it is and what it does, benefits, side effects Mm -hmm. to it. So people can make a more informed choice because, again, there's a lot of misinformation uh, online um, and also sometimes even in the media. So, uh, so again, I have a whole chapter that explains, you know, in detail with research backing it up, uh, the different kind of myths about medication. I provide uh, research that kind of refutes those myths. Great. And thank you for doing that because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so we were talking about exercise and mm-hmm. um, omegas and a uh, um, certain number of different things. So let's talk about exercise for a minute because, uh, you know, I know that, that there's a lot of, of, of research that really talks about how important exercise is. But will you kind of speak to some of the, the nuances of what, what kind of exercise? Uh, any type of exercise where you're moving around, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services recommends an hour of exercise a day. Really? The majority of that, yes, being cardiovascular work mm-hmm. with a smaller percentage being resistance training, you know, lifting weights, smaller percentage being bone strengthening, like jumping, swimming, and only about 40% of people in the U.S. meet that criteria. So logic kind of tells you because that motivation piece with ADHD, that percentage may be even lower in people with ADHD. So really important that we get people motivated to move. And I think the key piece is just to move, not so much what kind of movement you're doing or how intense it is, Mm -hmm. but just to get out there and get on a a, a kind of regular exercise program. Mm -hmm. But always, you know, I tell people first, you know, check with your doctor before you start exercising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, No, I know for me, that's uh, that's definitely has made a big difference in in my management of ADHD Mm -hmm. and really uh, focusing on that that cardio piece and really uh, um, intense cardio too. And even like just uh, spurts of of intense cardio I find to be very, very helpful um, yes. for, for focus. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, that, you probably read the book Spark, uh, John Rady. 
Right. Right. I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful book. And I always tell my wife, if I ever fall out of my exercise routine, I told her to make me read that book again. Uh, Cause that was like, the, when I read, after I read that book, I was like, I have to like, in good consciousness and as, as a clinician, not just for myself and, and, mm-hmm. and how I manage my ADHD, but recommend that as part of the treatment package for, uh, for my clients. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a really effective form of treatment. Uh, and uh, also, studies have found not only does it help raise brain chemicals, but just reading a study, something about the proteins uh, in your brain and something about how it helps just how the brain functions and communicates. So, mm-hmm. you know, really important stuff that happens. And also, people with ADHD are more prone to heart disease and, and uh, diabetes. So, mm-hmm. exercise is part of, and eating uh, healthy is part of the, the overall. You know, way that you practice good self care and you know try to reduce your your risk rate for developing mm-hmm. those. Um, can you talk a little bit about the connection? Do you know much about the connection between ADHD and diabetes? Not sure uh, what it is, whether it's shared genes. Um, I'm not clear, but uh, but I know that people with ADHD you know, on average do have a higher rate of di- diabetes in the general population. Okay. It could also be that maybe people with ADHD are more prone to, to eating uh, processed food or, mm-hmm. or sugars. Uh, also, um, really kind of unclear as to whether there's a mechanism that causes or some kind of issue with metabolizing. I'm not really sure what the connection is, but I think okay. the key piece is that people with ADHD really need to wash their added sugar content mm-hmm. and uh, make sure that they're eating uh, in a healthy way. Okay. Now, what about people who um, are are almost exercise sort of um, uh, obsessively? Do you see a lot of that as well? Um, Sometimes, and, and I think that there are apps that will track your uh, exercise. Uh, there's one called Fitocracy that's spelled like democracy, except with fit in the front. Cool. And that's a free app that you earn points for exercise. But I think it also shows people how much exercise they're doing. And so I think that uh, if someone just has obsessive tendencies, I'm not talking about diagnosed OCD, but if you have obsessive tendencies or people with ADHD tend to overdo stuff, I think it gives you a pretty accurate read as to how much you're exercising and maybe if you need to back off a little bit. Okay. And I think same thing with eating too. There's apps like My Fitness Pal. Oh, mm-hmm. I don't get paid by any of the apps I'm mentioning. Uh, My Fitness Pal also keeps track of eating. And I think that I, it's, it's, it is worth mentioning that I am an, an Apple affiliate. So okay. when these things are, are, uh, are linked on my website, so you know all like the 99 cent apps? I think I get like 5% of that. So I'm going to get rich no time soon, but I will get a, a tiny sliver of that. <laughs> well, well, my fitness pal, I think that's available for Android and Apple. Um, oh, okay. My fitness pal, you keep track of what you're eating. Uh, and I think because people with ADHD have a four times higher rate of obesity and being overweight than mm. the general population, I think keeping track of what you're eating and really seeing how much those calories are worth and how much they add up to and how much exercise burns those calories, I think that's a really important tool for people with ADHD to use. Yeah, wow. No, I, I don't think I, I knew that there was a higher correlation between obesity and, and ADHD. I didn't realize it was four times. Wow. wow. Well, there's also four times higher rate of eating disorders in women with ADHD, and it's almost exclusively bulimia. So <laughs> that's another thing to, to keep in mind, too. <laughs> so I usually sometimes I recommend that people go see a dietitian uh, or, you know, obviously their, their regular doctor uh, to get on a healthy eating program. Okay. Um, now what about different uh, types of diet? We hear a lot about, you know, it's high protein. Um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, like gluten free, these kinds of, of things. You know, what- well, gluten free, uh, there's recently a study uh, with people with ADHD and celiac disease and people just with ADHD. And if you had celiac disease, the gluten free diet helped with that, but overall did not help with ADHD symptoms. And here's another thing where people with ADHD are more prone to developing celiac disease. Not really clear why. Hmm. That's interesting. Interesting. It seems like we're in the very beginning um, uh, kind of phases of really uh, it's good research, um, kind of weeding some of these these things out. Well, I think once we decode the human genome, I think we're going to find out a lot more about how the genes are related, gene mutations. Uh, so it's really exciting. I think we're going to know in the next five years more than we've known in the last 50 about wow. the brain and genetics. So pretty exciting time. Yeah, for right? sure. You're sure. having the time of genetic studies. Yeah, some of these things just, you know, uh, um, mind boggling what they're able to do now with some of this research. Um, now, what about the omegas? I know I saw and I, I read a number of studies that basically say that it's 
It might be slightly helpful, but we're not completely sure. It's basically the gist right. of what I read. Studies show that they can be somewhat helpful. Uh, and also um, studies, uh, some studies have found that people with ADHD tend to be low in omegas uh, when they get their blood taken. So mm. it's unclear whether people just with ADHD tend to have less omegas that they're exposed to, or is it just the body processes them differently, or is there some other factor? It's really unclear. Mm-hmm, uh, but mm-hmm. omegas you can get from fish, from krill, from flaxseed oil. Also, there are a lot of vegetables with omegas in them. Uh, if you Google uh, omega levels in vegetables, you'll get a full list mm. of uh, vegetables, you know, including like spinach has omegas in it, cauliflower, peppers, all sorts of different foods. So omegas are, are in a lot of different places. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Um... And what about if people are taking like uh, fish oil supplements? Fish oil supplements, I always check with your doctor first. Uh, and also the uh, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. They're regulated right. by the FTC. Mm-hmm. So it's really important that you get a good quality supplement. Um, there are uh, sometimes the companies talk about their quality assurance data on their websites. There's also a website called Consumer Labs. I believe that's a yearly subscription where they review different products. Mm. Because you'll see on some omega supplements, they'll say 50% active ingredient, some will say 80% active ingredient. Also, a side effect of uh, omegas is that can act as blood thinners. So if people are taking blood thinners like Coumadin and heparin, they really need to check with their doctor before they wow. even start taking anything like that. Okay. So just because it's, you know, quote unquote, all natural doesn't mean it's safe. Right. And the other thing is natural is not regulated by any governmental entity. So anything can call itself natural. Organic is regulated by the USDA, mm-hmm. um, but things like natural are not. So ADHD rewired, it's all natural. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now uh, mindfulness. This has been a, definitely a hot topic, I think, not just be in, in kind of pop culture, but because the, the science is really backing it up. Right. A lot of data showing for a while it's worked with uh, anxiety and depression. Now it's being looked at for ADHD. Uh, Lydia Zylowska is mm-hmm. a psychiatrist in California that specializes in mindfulness and ADHD has found some pretty remarkable improvements uh, in ADHD symptoms for people that were doing a, a mindfulness group mm-hmm. for eight weeks. So right, right. a lot of data showing that staying in the here and now mm-hmm. uh, and also uh, repeating that can help the brain kind of self-regulate, meaning mm-hmm. it helps it stay more on task. I know in her, but, stu- in her studies, didn't they do pre and post uh, fMRI scans mm-hmm. and actually showed structural differences in the brain from in just an eight-week Right, group? you can get a, a larger frontal lobe. My understanding is not really sure what that means yet, but mm-hmm. uh, also there's another study uh, by another group that found that uh, monks that have meditated for quite a long time at different ways their brains fired and, and scans rather than mm. people that just meditated for a short period of time or not at all. So we do know that meditation changes the way the brain fires and where it fires. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you meditate? Yeah, actually I do. And I found it to be very helpful for ADHD. Yep. Would you, mind, would you mind sharing with us a little about like what, what you do? Sure. Um, there are several apps around. There's one called Simply Being that uh, that you just set it for 5, 15, 20 minutes. And it walks you through a deep breathing exercise. You can meditate that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes just sitting in a quiet space. Also with mindfulness, you just focus on what you're doing. There's an acronym in mindfulness called STOP, which is stop what you're doing. Take a deep breath or diaphragmatic breath. That means breathing with your tummy. Uh, Observe, look around you, and P, proceed. Mm -hmm. Continue doing what you're doing. Change up your behavior. So, again, staying in the here and now and just really focusing on the task at hand, that's a form of meditation. Mm -hmm. Isn't there in that acronym uh, two Ps with the the final only practice what works? Have you seen that one? Oh, I like that. I haven't seen that one, but hey, why not throw that other It's funny because I'll present this to some of my clients who are also you know, high functioning on the autism spectrum. And they sometimes have a hard time with the fact that there's a typo. It's like, this is not a typo. It's a... <laughs> and let's say the last P again. Um, practice. So practice what works. Oh, yeah. And, and Zylaska found too that you had to continue doing the mindfulness practice at least I think it was a few times a week mm-hmm. uh, to retain the effects of that. Okay. And that's, that seems to be similar to any kind of something that's like, you know, under the realm of like what you guess you can call brain training. 
oh, like brain training, like computer brain well, I guess there, stuff, there's, there's that even like neurofeedback, you know, anything that's like a, a, an activity that you are engaging your attention in that, that is designed to, you know, re restructure your brain in, in some right. way. And well, I just want to add not a lot of research showing that brain games or neurofeedback right. have, have been found to be really successful. Right. So. Yeah. I know that there, I think we're, there's the, they're in the second or third year of a large five uh, multi-site study of really a, a um, getting good research on neurofeedback to get a better understanding mm. of it. So uh, that'll be exciting when That'd that, be exciting when that to yeah. see what the research says. Yeah, because yeah, on an intuitive level, it makes a lot of sense, but we but the data that's available, it just we don't right. know I enough. One of the latest research studies I've shown is, or I've I'm not I've shown, but I've read is that there was a neurofeedback study where they either gave kids neurofeedback or a bogus or sham treatment, mm -hmm. meaning that. They thought it was neurofeedback or really wasn't. Mm -hmm. And they asked parents and kids to guess what treatment they were actually on, the, the bogus one or the neurofeedback, and yeah. their answers were better than chance. Yeah. So, you know, we need a lot more research available. So that's good they're doing a multi-year study. Right, because I guess one of the problems that's been identified in that research is that, um, that like, you know, Dr. John's clinic does neurofeedback one way and, you know, uh, Dr. Jane's clinic does it a different way. So there's not, there's not a really systematic way to look at how it's being being applied right and one of the other things i discovered through researching for the book is that people can have varied levels of training and during doing neurofeedback so really important that people check with a clinician to see what level of training they've had when they're doing that mm -hmm. now neurofeedback is an offshoot of biofeedback which is using your brain to help kick in your parasympathetic uh, nervous system or the nervous system that kicks in when you're relaxed and that has been found to be effective in reducing stress levels of mm -hmm. people with ADHD. Maybe not their symptoms per se, but their stress level. Mm -hmm. So neurofeedback, again, we don't have as much data supporting that. And also it can get quite expensive and no insurance company covers it at this point. Right. So one of the things I talk to people about is what's your return on investment? Mm -hmm. The amount of money you're spending, are you really getting you know, a lasting effect from it? That's great. Um, let's talk a little bit about risks of natural herbs. So because the uh, FDA does not regulate uh, herbal supplements, so that was of 1994, there's a federal act that said that, that the uh, supplements are now under the guise of the FTC. Uh, they don't have the same quality assurance practices. The FDA basically has these set practice parameters that you have to follow before the product can even get released. Mm -hmm. And the way the FTC works is something usually goes out on the shelf, and if it's recalled, then it's brought back in. Uh, so it's really important that people check uh, quality assurance because some studies have found varying doses from pill to pill within one bottle uh, and from bottle to bottle mm. of a supplement. So really important that they check, you know, quality assurance, uh, make sure they're if they want to go that route. But studies overall, even studies going up to this year, have found that ginkgo biloba, ginseng, St. John's wort, kava kava, valerian root have not shown any effectiveness in treating ADHD or any other cognitive disorders, such as memory disorders. Did you see that report that that uh, there was like five different uh, uh, supplements that were taken off the shelf, I think at, at Target and a couple other um, big brand stores and four of the five, uh, basically it was like the, sub, the the whatever they said was supposed to be in there was not in there. Right, and that's the thing that again, like things like Consumer Labs, they look at the ingredient list and see if it's accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, so generally I do not recommend supp herbal supplements because of the varying degrees of quality and lack of efficacy. Mm -hmm. What about other herbals as in marijuana? Uh, marijuana has been found to show a uh, motivation uh, decrease, which mm -hmm. in ADHD already have difficulties in motivation. Also finding that it may be able to lead to a COPD constructive or chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. uh, also showing some issues with uh, short-term and long-term memory, both after acute use and chronic use. Mm -hmm. One of the um, at the research symposium at this past uh, Chad conference, they did a, there was a, um, the session was of mindfulness and marijuana. Um, they basically combined two topics and, and it was, a, it was good. One of the things they looked at was the, the um, decision-making as one of the most impaired features of, mm -hmm. uh, of, of use, um, you know, and, and because of just the, the, different strains that are out there um, there's no way to really you know systematically look at this stuff and say you know what is it helping how is it impairing um, but, right and but, the potency has become it's become much stronger every mm -hmm. you know almost every year mm -hmm. or so uh, the benefits of it you know really the side effects are really great right and they actually work against ADHD rather yes. than with it so all, all the studies that have, are currently out basically say 
there's no benefit. In fact, it's, right. it's pretty, it's pretty bad for you. Um, right. so it's, so it's not this kind of benign substance that, you know, right. um, that sometimes people think it is. Mm-hmm. Um, let's say I want to respect your time and I know that our time is short right now. I know you have to run. Um, anything else that you think is really important for people to know about um, uh, the the natural relief for, for ADHD? Well, I think uh, also uh, when people are looking at non-medication treatments, anything that requires you to sign a contract, that can be a tip off. It's not that great of a treatment. Mm-hmm. Uh, treatments that have, um, that have a lot of data behind them, legitimate treatments usually do not have any type of contract. I know I mentioned, I know your last podcast, you're talking about tre- contracts with um, therapy. That's more a consent. So I just want to mm-hmm. clarify that for people. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just something to keep in mind that if you're asked to sign a contract, you know, that's a big red flag. Yeah. Um, also, uh, if you're thinking about treatment, you know, take the paperwork home for 24 hours, consult with uh, other people, consult with your prescriber, uh, with your clinician uh, and see if that's a treatment that is a viable option for you. And again, the most effective treatments have also been found to be the, the least costly and the most accessible, which is really good news for people with ADHD. Mm, that's great, great information. Stephanie, how can people reach you? Uh, through my website, that's stephaniesarkis.com, S-T-E-P-H-A-N-I-E-S-A-R-K-I-S.com. Also through my blog and Huffington Post and Psychology Today as well. All right. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for uh, being a guest on, on my podcast. And uh, people can reach you um, online and through your website. And we appreciate your time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank my sponsors, Zoom and Audible. Together, they provide the technology and the inspiration to help me do what I do with this podcast. I haven't mentioned this in a while, but another way that you could support this podcast is by using the Amazon search portal at my website. Just go to ADHDrewired.com. It's there on the right-hand side. It's yellow. It's kind of like a square says Amazon, you'll see it and you'll know it when you see it. So thank you. It doesn't cost you any more and it helps out this podcast. If you want to make a video and share your story for Chad's one in 15 million campaign, send me an email to Eric at Eric Use the subject line Chad video. Also, I have a link for you to go to, to the donation page so you can make a donation to Chad. Just go to erictibbers.com slash Chad. Also, I learned this week that Chad received a $50,000 donation from a generous donor. If you by any chance have those kinds of means and you believe in science and research education and support and advocacy around ADHD, if we think that those causes are important, reach out to chad at chad.org or contact me and I will put you in contact with the right people who will gladly take your money. Thank you. ADHD Rewired is on Facebook. You can like our page, but submit your request to join our free and growing community. And please check your other inbox because I screen everybody before they come into the group. If you're interested in joining the next ADHD Rewired Coaching Group, you can let me know now by going to coachingrewired.com. That's coachingrewired.com. Or schedule a free call with me by clicking the scheduling button at the top of my webpage. Ratings and reviews on iTunes are like gold stars on my sticker chart. And let's be clear, star charts are not just for kids. Help keep this podcast viable and visible in iTunes by leaving a review. I really appreciate it. It really helps other people find this podcast. And don't forget, I mentioned at the top of the the podcast, if you want to be a part in it, telling me what you want the ADHD rewired book to be about. I have a quick survey for you to fill out. It's, I think it's two, two questions long. So it'll take you about a minute. You will be entered into the drawing to win the ADHD rewired mystery box of awesomeness. The link to the survey is in the show notes app. 
It's on the show notes page at my website. It'll be posted on in the ADHD Rewired community. It's going to be everywhere where you find ADHD Rewired. I hope you are having a good week. Until next week. Bye.